Hey there, I'm Mr. Terry, a high school history teacher. Welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video. All right, famous YouTuber Johnny Harris has been blowing it up this last few months as he's been talking about colonial and imperial history, specifically surrounded by European imperialism. And in some of the videos he's been doing recently, he's been discussing why Europeans have been successful in the last, let's say, 200 years when it comes to global imperialism and global colonialism. And his most recent video at the time I'm looking at this was about four days ago and it already has over a million views, which even for him is a huge number in that short a period of time. I've also noticed that other YouTubers have been responding to his videos with criticisms. Now I've done some reaction videos and some commentary videos on some of his stuff. So if you wanna check that out, you can definitely find it very easily. One response video that has just recently been done is by my good friend, Mr. Beat, who like me also responded to his video on inflation. But as history is more of my forte, I'm really excited to check out this video and give you my thoughts. And this one is titled, How Europe Stole Africa So Quickly. So this seems to be about the scramble for Africa, which is a topic that I'm really interested in and something that's a big part of school curriculums. Or if it's not where you live, it should be. So this is gonna be a live reaction and commentary. If I see things that, you know, I think stand up, then I'll let you know. Or if there's things that maybe don't, you're gonna hear from me as well. Johnny's video is down below. All right, let's get started. He always starts off with some map porn. <laughs> We need to look at something astounding that happened over the course of like a hundred years. This is the final chapter and what I think is the most mind boggling chapter in the story of how Europe took over the world. The reason why it's so mind boggling is because this is the part of the story where the map goes from looking like this in 1800 with Europe controlling like 35% of the world's land to looking like any huge percent of that being by the British, especially who had the biggest empire in world history. This by 1914. By the time of World War One. Virtually the entire continent of Africa, with a couple exceptions, we'll see if he gets into it, um, are going to be colonized. To looking like this by 1914. With 84% of the earth being controlled by the people, or the descendants of the people, from this once isolated continent, Europe. 84%. How on earth did this happen? A lot of reasons. I hope he doesn't just get down to like one reason or two reasons. There's multiple reasons. I'll be sure to interject. A huge part of this next chapter has to do with this continent, the second largest continent on Earth, and the part of the world that the Europeans hadn't really carved up yet. So you can talk about why? Because I do have. So this is where the whole that. story comes together and shows us how technology and different ways of thinking helped these people take over the world and in the process shaped the world we live in today. The way that we trade, where we get our stuff, the language I'm using to speak to you right now and most of you understand it even though you don't live anywhere near the place where it was invented. I'm telling you this isn't far away history anymore. This is the world we currently live in. So let me show you the yeah. third and final chapter of how Europe stole the world. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, he's right. This stuff is a lot more current than you think. It's late 1800s, only a few generations removed, and the effects of it are absolutely immediately seen. So. This is where Johnny's so good with the animated maps and the maps themselves. Yeah, if you're into map porn, as I was calling it earlier. Another video, another set of beautiful printed maps. And I'm telling you, this is the chapter where the maps get really good. Cartography really took off. Okay, let's get up to speed it's on true. where we're at. Um, mm -hmm. European cartography of Africa was minuscule. One of the things I'll, I'll hopefully be talking about is interestingly to the interior of Africa, even though Europeans had attempted to colonize and had some success on uh, the outer uh, rim of Africa since about the 1500s had never really done much in the interior of Africa for many reasons, but overall they were unable to, uh, but the interior African Geography was very unknown to Europeans. Remember, it all started with Spain and Portugal. They ramped up this colonialism thing back around 1500, and this led them to divide sure. the world between them until other European countries got in on it too. Then the real competition mm -hmm. started. The Dutch created the modern corporation, which allowed them to speed Dutch all Dutch East India up. Company. The world quickly turned into a Dutch East India Company. I, I think he has a video. Uh, I haven't seen it yet. There one one before that was like how because I know this is a series, but I haven't reacted to it. What I'm going to talk about how like Europe colonized stuff or something like that and i think just on a thumbnail or something i saw stuff about like the dutch east india company dutch east india company is a joint stock company britain had one very similar the british east india company which were um, privately invested corporations that operated with government permission to basically engage in any kind of economic behavior that they want to including creating monopolies establishing their own taxes and 
engaging in war if they want to. To a giant marketplace run by Europeans with boats and guns and incentives to bring profits to the shareholders. But also, I should I'm sure to mention Spanish and Portuguese imperialism um, started way before uh, um, the Dutch East India Company and the Dutch, a good almost century before. Oh. This is well, all you a can't, huge you can't part put of the story, the but Dutch. I'm telling you. Uh, you can't put it in the hands of the Dutch, and especially not in Africa, as the Dutch East India Company focused on Southeast Asia and the Spice Trade. When chain. it comes to scale, imperialism is just getting started. And that's because Europeans are well, a new wave up. of it is. We're going to call this Imperialism 2.0, a new way yeah. of taking over the world, fueled mostly by technology Maximum machine gun and a rare that. cooperation between all of these empires. One British Prime Cooperation Minister, or just agreeing to not step on each other's toes. Or described this imperialism 2.0 as, quote, the because <laughs> cooperate. We get World War One because of this, you guys. Vulgar and bastard imperialism of irritation and aggression of grabbing everything, even if we had no use for it. Exploitation. Let me tell you, if you're like me and you kind of have a low key implicit belief that European domination was inevitable and that this was going to happen no matter what, I'm here to tell you that it almost didn't happen. It didn't have to happen at all. That's because we'll see by the end of the 1700s, revolution was in the air. No, especially because so many of these some of these empires are going to be built by their domination to the Americas and the funding of it, especially like the uh, um, say like Spain or something that gets a lot of this started. And their big thing was it happened accidentally, a lot of their conquest for the fact of their success of the conquest of their empire, because it was focused on the Americas, where disease is what killed off 90 percent of the population, which paved the way for them to exploit the region and get the gold and silver um, so that they would need to be able to trade with Asia as Europe as Europeans use the um, silver and and uh, currency basically coming out of the Americas to be able to engage in their profit building of their empires because places like India or China, for example, well, China mostly, um, did not want European made goods. European goods were not as good as say Chinese goods. And places like India and China would though accept American silver coming out, which was only made uh, possible because of disease, which was an accidental conqueror, as you go into immune systems and all that stuff, if you know about the, the disease and the um, how disease outbreaks and immunity affected the Americas. But anyway, um, yeah, we're already missing key components right now. Empires were losing their colonies. Starting I do with love his animated Europeans maps. Who were done having a king and declaring independence for themselves in the late 1700s. Soon you had a bunch of Spanish colonies declaring independence. Right. And then over here in Haiti, Early you had enslaved people who were organizing and rebelling against their French masters. Uh, France's most profitable colony. Throwing them out losing and starting that. their own country. These empires weren't only losing their colonies. Back in Europe, one rule. But they had made a fortune up to this point. Ruler even Remember lost that. his head in all of this. The empires were losing Rip their grip, and soon they were fighting with one another like never before. It was chaos, and it totally freaked these European rulers out. Are they losing their empire? Are they going to lose their reins on power? Is the era of abundance and domination coming to an end? No. We can't let this happen. So they start doing something that was kind of unheard of. Instead of fighting and competing with each other, like they've always done, the European powers start talking to each other. Their empires were in jeopardy and they needed to collaborate, find ways to share power both at home and yeah. Europe. <laughs> They're gonna fight each other this whole time. We're missing a whole bunch of nationalistic wars of the entire 1800s here though. World stage. Soon this new culture of diplomacy and collaboration would turn yeah. to focus I don't, on I don't, I don't know about this one, none of these European and powers had carved up yet. The new imperial frontier, certainly full of resources, but not yet conquered. Dude, there are a lot of still untapped markets, Africa being the biggest by far untapped market, if you want to talk about this. I mean, the maps tell the story here. The maps were like a record of what Europeans knew and didn't know about the world. I True. mean, this one British map from 1800s says it all. Very what accurate. Say? Europeans were definitely familiar with Africa. With the coast. Especially with the, here with the, in the coast. Because right, the they had been... They had been exploring it since the 1500s by the time the mid-1800s They had around. trading posts and, of course, right. the Atlantic slave trade. But look how they map the interior of the continent. Exactly. Yeah, it said parts unknown. Let me go back there. Remember, this and was not for a lack of Atlantic trying. Slave trade. But look how and not because Europeans were not working together here, if Johnny's trying to say this. Uh, it's like a reverse of what happened in the Americas. Like, 
we don't know the, the Europeans. They didn't know the geography. Okay. There were diseases in Africa that Europeans and their horses could get as well plus the terrain is so difficult in africa you have a desert the size of the united states in the north of the sahara you have thick jungles and mountains um this is an era before the steamships and ways to use rivers as navigation which is going to be the major reason why african interior colonization is going to actually take place but it wasn't for a lack of working together or something like that whether if, if they wanted to work together would never have been able to do this it's why with the slave trade europeans um we're more likely to depend on current African states and trade with them. And then they would go uh, conduct the slave raids and uh, much of the acquisition of slaves in the interior of Africa because the Africans were much better at that and had much more power and ability to do that than Europeans did for, you know, again, 300 years of slavery until, uh, you know, the next phase. Well, they map the interior of the continent. It literally just gives up and is like inland parts, almost entirely unknown, which is pretty rare <laughs> for this time period. At this point, the Europeans actually kind of really like that map. That's interesting. World. But this place was off limits. It was the stuff of legend, of myths. The caption here on the map says that this interior part of Africa may be considered as absolutely unknown or completely unexplored. All we know, says the map, is you could that just it's ask, immense... You could just ask the people in Africa there. And they know it very well. are intersected with complete collections of the most ferocious them, beasts and most uncivilized men. That's all they know. There was a very good reason for this. The fact is that soldiers and explorers from Europe who went into this area, a lot of them didn't come home. Up to 40% died from yeah. diseases like the mosquito-borne illness He's getting the, the, the points so that are so important here. that this part of the map became known as the white man's grave. Yeah. Totally off limits. But that right soon here. changed. Medicine. Oh, we're getting medicine from the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution is what conquered every obstacle that Europeans had. It's going to conquer the transportation issues as well as the medical issues. Two giant things happen that change everything, completely redirect what Europeans can do with their mounting power. First, these two French guys are able to take the bark of this tree, which had been used for a very long time for a variety of purposes, and New isolate medicines. a vital chemical called quinine. It combats yep, quinine malaria, was huge. the major killer of Europeans in Africa. Yeah. They now have a white man's shield to protect them from the white man's grave. Right. The door is slowly creaking open. Yep. Second, this guy happens. King Leopold II. He's the king of this new country called Belgium, and it existed for like 40 yep. years. He starts the entire thing. It all, it, the European scramble for Africa starts with this notoriously brutal guy. It's right kind here. of a minor place in Europe. Nothing like these OG colonizers. So it's like 1875, and King Leopold wants to play with the big boys. He wants a colony. So he literally goes around and starts asking these major colonial powers for like some of their land. Like he goes to the now o Belgium, by the way, was the second industrial er, country to industrialize in Europe. Um, with a lot of help from, you know, England, uh, who kind of outsourced a lot of stuff to them. Uh, but Belgium is very limited on resources. So if they wanted to keep up any kind of presence in this new economic industrial world, you know, they had a motivation to try to tap untapped markets. And in this case, it's going to be Central Jeez, Africa and Congo. And he's like, hey, guys, I know you're in decline. Can I have one of your colonies? And they're like, no. And so then he goes to the British. No and he's cooperation. Like, hey, guys, I know you have New Guinea. Maybe you don't have any plans for it. You could give it to me. We have old and Guinea? Like, no, Leo, don't you realize how hard we worked to steal this land? We're not going to give it to you as a handout. So King Leopold decides to take matters into his own hands. He turns to the Or you don't need to feel bad for Leopold for what he's map. about to do. Parts unknown, where none of the colonizers have arrived to yet it's a prime place for his colony king leopold sets his sight on the white man's grave a quick reminder that this is kind of the fantasy of the europeans who haven't explored this in reality at this point africa looks a lot more like this but in the mind of king leopold and other mm, yeah and with if you have an ethnic map it would be way more divisive even of this europeans it's a big blank canvas with unlimited possibilities so Leopold sends explorers to like the dead center of this blank canvas. And they're armed, not only with some of the latest and greatest. I, I hope he's going to talk about the steamships, um, taking steamships up the, the Congo, which goes from the ocean on the, in the west um, to the center. Uh, he hasn't met, uh, yet said industrialization yet. I think that's Weapons. such an important key thing we're missing. It shields them from these killer tropical diseases. These Belgian explorers arrive and are able to make agreements horses couldn't with the locals survive it before laying either. claim to this land. King Leopold now has his own little colony in the center of the white man's grave. 
And of course, they start mapping it. This is a map from a bunch of Belgian cartographers and explorers when they first arrive to this center part of Africa. Very little detail here at the beginning. This is 1880. They basically got this river, some of the offshoots, but they don't really know what's going on in here yet. This becomes the frame that Leopold uses to build his colony. Of course, this freaks the French out because they're like, hey, what's yeah. Belgium doing in exactly. Africa? Let's Why start to scramble. This land? So Everybody jumps in now. Own explorers to claim their own bit of land. After all, they've got Algeria. It's not nearly as dangerous. And the Belgians France are stays it. mostly in the north and west Africa, though. Well, of course, now the British are waking up. They're sending people, too. And even the new kid on the imperial block, Germany, is chipping in. And now, suddenly... Yep, Germany just was unified by... Bismarck, who wants to get in on this. But wait, say the European powers, let's learn from our mistakes. Instead of the old days where we always had to fight over things, in this era of revolution and warfare, remember that we're trying to be better about talking to one another? Coordinating? Remember? So it's 1884, and all these big Africa-hungry yeah. European empires get together in Berlin. I mean, this yeah. is an amazing painting of just... Berlin Conference, city. huge moment in history right here, not just for African history, um, but especially for African history. It is going to... This, you know, happening <laughs> uh, hundred, over 140 years ago, almost, almost 140 years ago, is a reason so much why Africa even is the way it is today. This is a major thing here. Africa, here. Uh, or the this Berlin big, Conference. Beautiful map, which is like an amazing activity Bismarck. to do until you realize what's actually happening here. You've got the Chancellor of Germany. You've got the OG colonizers, Portugal, explaining this place to Belgium and France and Italy. And you've even got the new country, the United States, who showed up. Kind of new yeah. to all this imperial stuff, but quickly learning how power really works on the international stage. I hope they talk about Liberia. The United States' interest in Liberia as a place that was meant to be for freed um, slaves, freed African Americans to return, they felt, to Africa. A lot of people in the United States felt that freed African Americans would probably be better off going to Africa. And Liberia was a place the United States had kind of protected as a place that that could happen. I think in the end, maybe try to remember, was it 10,000? We were from like 10 to 30,000, I think, actually went over the decades, but. Not as much as a lot of people were hoping for in the United States. Stage. Basically, anyone in Europe who didn't have an empire yet got in now. Oh, yeah. and crucially, they didn't invite any African leaders. Yep, and zero. To be clear, this That's the thing. No African leaders were able to be at this conference, which, as you're about to see, is going to decide the fate of Africa, which shows the European nations did not care what at all about the pre-existing nations or people there. He isn't like exaggerated, like it's not a political cartoon. This is literally a bunch of European dudes in a room in Berlin in 1884, discussing and coordinating how they're going to carve up and take this continent. And they decided that there was gonna be one big rule for this new scramble for Africa. No pretending, none of this only on the map fake imperialism thing that the Pope arranged for Spain and Portugal a few hundred years previous. The line of demarcation, 1494, five, it bounced around, which nobody cared about, though, unless you were Portugal or Spain, because they were Catholic nations. This is post-Protestant Reformation, or actually, right, actually, I should say that. I should not say that, because <laughs> the Protestant Reformation is about to start about a decade after this. But after that, like, Protestant nations, they give a crap what the Pope said, who, which countries, you know, get which colonies, and that only pertain to Spain and Portugal. Anyways, who were remained Catholic through the Reformation. You actually have to control the land if you're going to claim it. So they divide up the map right. on who gets what, they leave it's the not conference, just dibs. and they get to work. The French start moving in quickly from West Let's talk about the rules. The British begin taking over Sudan and expanding north. Okay, from I don't down. know if he's going to get to the rules, though, that actually they, they set up rules, which basically said, if you, if you go there and claim land that is unclaimed, then you can have permission to have that land. But unclaimed meaning by who? By other Europeans. It's already claimed by African nations, but that was the, the rule there. And you also had to publicly, uh, to the European community, declare your claims, uh, make everyone, and you have to let everyone else know if you have come to a place that you have claimed that was unclaimed before, so. I'm here in South Africa to take over all of this land. The Germans really start establishing themselves here and over here. And Italy Tanzania, starts occupying all Namibia, this land here in the north and east. Italy and wants Leopold, to control the Red Sea. Well, he got his colony, 77 times the size of Belgium. Here it was as a blank canvas when they first started exploring in 1880. 
Here it is 14 years later. Little which, Belgium down here, giant Congo yeah. up here. Which, by the way, this early era is not even really a Belgian colony. I mean, it kind of is. It's a personal real estate. It was, it was personal real estate of King Leopold. It was personal real estate of his. Um, which also meant that he could do whatever he wanted there without a lot of suspicion or with even without a government interference. And hopefully he gets to the awful genocide um, that happened uh, here, which is going to end up killing millions, which got swept under the rug for uh, years. Here, the blueprint has filled out. The conquest is complete. With his new colony, King Leopold, of course, went on to do. By the way, he's looking for rubber. Rubber is what they want. Resources from this place and wreaking horrible havoc for rubber. on people. And the it is horrific and it is horrendous. And I made a whole other video that kind of goes into it more. I'll link to oh, it. Oh, did he? Belgian. Go to the sources in the description, please. Dark part of Africa. Um, horrible. One of it is important for you to look at. It is probably shoot. I mean, it's hard to make these claims, but maybe the worst genocide that has been completely swept under the rug especially ones conducted by uh european powers um the what happened in the congo check into it all of these empires were carving up this map coming in mapping it very beautifully it's like literally the opposite of what it was it was unknown and now it's totally known pillaging the resources bringing it back home making record profits Ooh, et cetera, et cetera. beautiful I, I mean i know i know he doesn't mean that i get a positive sense we also need to make sure we understand that these borders were created by europeans and took into account not at all any kind of cultural ethnic or linguistic borders um, that were in Africa. They do not represent, represent Africans at all, which is going to be a major problem, especially when, you know, after the World Wars, when a lot of these regions start getting their independence, um, the borders do not actually represent any type of cultural unity and becomes very problematic for African nations that are trying to build themselves back up because they started from a, a, a spot of disunity. Etc. And all of this, and this carving, cultural history. it happened really fast. Yeah, within a couple decades. By, by late 1800s to by 1914, by the route break of World War oh, Wait a minute, hold on, pause. How does this make any sense? Like it made sense when it was all like on water and there were ships and there was domination and trading ports and all of that. But this, this is an incredibly a logistically ambitious thing to do. Like this was actually a central question for me that led me the to disease. make this series. We didn't talk about travel because yet. Because I just didn't understand how these countries in a matter of a few years could completely carve up the second largest continent. It also depends continent. if you're an indirect or a direct question, colonizer. Isn't that surprising? These Europeans now had a leg up. They had new tools. Maxim machine gun. Remember they had invented capitalism to make them rich. That gave them time to do science, which gave them technology that they used to make their capitalism better and more effective, more productive. This cycle repeated itself over and over and over, giving Europeans a further and further leg up technology. Let's say they're all practicing soon, capitalism they had stuff necessarily like this, though. A steamboat. You didn't have to worry about the wind anymore. This is going. the big one. You could just steam your way all the way up yep. African rivers. Oh, Johnny gets this right. Queen. Or the railroad, a quick way yeah. to transport Later food on, and true. Railroad. You had to like colonize you before you could get the railroad. All of this building. red is either railroads that they put in or railroads that they were constructing at this time. Right. And this allowed Europeans to level up. Britain tried to make one from Egypt all the way to South Africa because they had a string of colonies from Egypt to South Africa with one block, which was uh, Tanzania, which was uh, belonged to the Germans. You know, they had colonized it and also was part of World War One and fighting for that territory because Britain wanted to be able to basically create a uh, a railroad that went the entire north south. Um, navigation of Africa. Not just in Africa, but everywhere. I mean, here they are in India. The British quickly taking over this entire subcontinent of what today is India and Pakistan and Bangladesh with this massive complex rail system that they built basically in no time. They also invented the telegraph, which could now relay messages in a matter of Yeah, that cuts time and space. I mean, this political cartoon really personifies how powerful this was. And of course- Got Egypt to South Africa, see what he's doing? I mean, this political cartoon. There you go. See Egypt, the left foot, right foot, South Africa. Again, they wanted to create a string of colonies connected from his left foot to his right foot there and make a railroad. But that actually doesn't end up happening. But it was proposed. Uh, World War One messed that up. It really personifies how powerful this was. And of course, what we've been looking at this whole time. They made maps. We love it. Even maps. Huh? I mean, I love maps. The geography I love maps. But... And all of the land that they had conquered. 
addition to technology, these empires had also perfected the art of allying with local power holders and yes. turning the That's people huge. against each other, divide yes. and conquer, which allowed a small group of Europeans to control millions of locals. And this also depended on, say, like the British or the French, who um, British like to do a lot of the indirect, we call it colonialism, indirect rule, where you get people local to you, or sorry, loyal to you that are local, Give them benefits give them perks and they pledge their loyalty and do a lot of the operating for you then they're also like the french who went more head on and tried to do more of it themselves and not try to use local rulers so it kind of depends on the nation as well and of course they had these new weapons not said the word industrialization yet i think that's such a key thing we're missing Maybe we'll get to groups it. of European soldiers to rip through truly formidable African armies. Like, look at this painting from Sudan, where the British used their guns to slaughter 10,000 enemies with just a few hundred losses. Yeah. Here, this casual thousands versus hundreds, hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands versus hundreds when it comes to weapons of war, clearing way for civilization. You have an abundance of muskets and stuff in Africa. That, that goes back to the slave trade, as muskets were one of the main trading uh products the europeans were using to trade to africans for the slave trade um, but those are nothing in comparison to what's being been in the late 1800s which is machine guns versus you know muskets at best for what these african nations actually had for themselves now, it wasn't this easy everywhere. Descendants of white Dutch settlers held off the British for a long time down here in South Africa. That have been going on for a long time. They were able to hold off the Italians from conquering their yep. land. King Menelik. The only place in Africa to never be colonized. Yeah. Liberia is not a direct colony. That's a different thing. But Ethiopia is the big one. Ethiopia is the only one to militarily be able to defend itself. It had a fairly modernized um, army, comparatively speaking, and defeated the Italians. Um, Italy will come back under Mussolini in the 20s, so if you feel bad for Italy for not getting Ethiopia, you don't need to, but if you did, they are going to be back. But listen, in the midst of all this bloodshed, we have to talk about something that doesn't fit cleanly into our narrative of good versus evil. Because the presence of these Europeans in this continent also brought really positive things. Remember those French dudes that discovered the treatment for malaria? Well, that was tested in the field in French Algeria, a colony. It changed medicine forever, giving us our modern understanding of mosquitoes and the diseases they spread. The scramble into Africa helped push forward our understanding of health and disease and medicine. These and and tons of other medical who's our who's our because um there's not going to be a lot of treatment for a lot of these people that are going to suffer in Africa, though. Developments helped these Europeans conquer land, but it also brought innovation that we still use today. If war brings that innovation, it absolutely lives. does. War brings innovation. Okay, so technology you look at it as a net positive a or negative defining factor, but it wasn't just technology. Once again, we see in this chapter what we saw in other chapters, that Europeans had to develop new sophisticated mental inventions that allowed this all to go down. The popular story that they were telling themselves at this time like social was Darwinism? that all civilization could be ranked according to the level of development. Yeah, this is and the look, scientific according racism. to this analysis, they placed themselves at the top. And course. they could tell themselves very easily. <laughs> it just happened would... to be that they're going to rank races and of course at the top, you know. You can imagine who makes the racial superiority argument, which people. It's going to be, you know, the people that invented it. The enlightened people of the world. This new colonizing story was the most sophisticated I and tantalizing yet. In Popular, you may have even read something in a history class or a poem, White this Man's new... Burden, which really comes to exemplify what Europeans culturally their cultural superiority, they believed, which was that it was the burden, it was the duty of the white man to bring the others into civilization. Famous poem there, Rudyard Kipling, or uh, um, yeah, Rudyard Kipling, uh, writer of the Jungle Book. New colonizing story was the most sophisticated and tantalizing yet, and it's one that's still kind of embedded in a lot of our brains still. That the enlightened Living civilization in had a burden to bring civilization to the rest of the world, and for that. They kind of needed to stay on top and control. Except no one's asking And the reason why this story right? was so believable and tantalizing it? is because at this time, it was being blended with actual real objective science that yeah, was being done. Tried to. Yeah, opinions. you go back like to Darwin guy. in a lot of this. A lot of people were, were taking, like, trying to use Darwin's ideas about natural selection in the animal kingdom and then apply that to human species. And just like in 
the animal kingdom there are species that are more adapted to their environment therefore they survive and they become stronger and then they reproduce while the weaker nation or the weaker people or sorry weaker uh, species they end up dying out which leads to speciation and why so many species are extinct but then people are like hey if that is how it works amongst species in the animal kingdom then in humans Maybe there is a hierarchy that of stronger and more fitted, right, races and trying to use a scientific approach to that. That this became popular here. Charles Darwin, someone who changed the way that we think about the natural world. He had just put out a book about how animals evolve into hierarchies with different capabilities and traits. Well, if that applies to all animals, then it must apply to humans themselves and their societies and their civilizations. So then they go out into the field with their maps and they start gathering observations that they confirm really do this story. Measure the cranium. Soon they're measuring so. people's skulls all around the world. They're keeping notes. They're developing theories and terms, they're writing academic papers, all of this to define a pretend set of pseudoscientific ideas. Yeah. The idea that we're all- It was pseudoscientific because there's so many factors into civilization and stuff like that. It, there's so many other things to talk about, again, of what leads to that, what leads to civilization, how you define civilization and how Europeans are going to define it. You know, um, to, the reason for them is why they are rich and why they are powerful is become because of some kind of inherent superiority that they had when say industrialization requires so many other things um, that is not controlled, you know, it's not you know, human control. That has nothing to do with choice, right? It's geographic luck and timing and geography and all types of different things. Different but race, more for another time, all with maybe. different natural capabilities. And that is what must explain why some people have the resources and the technology and others do not. Yeah. Like the previous stories that you're- Yeah, you're gonna say that to like India or China? Some of those scientifically and like industrially advanced places on earth at that time throughout the middle ages and up to that point and say it was they were not as smart. No, there's a whole bunch of reasons for that, right? A whole bunch of reasons. Like they had a huge population where Europe had a small population. Therefore, they needed labor saving devices where labor is cheap in, say, India or China and labor saving devices could actually ruin a, an economy and put people out of work, um, you know, where you have in Europe where you have. Uh, labor is actually very expensive. You have a need for industrialization and mechanization where you didn't have that in places that traditionally have been much bigger uh, um, producers of things at larger numbers and of higher quality, which has happened for centuries, even millennia, say in Asia. Told themselves this one was intoxicating. Think of all the generations that passed where this story could be ingrained into the minds of the people. But again, remember that like, I'm not saying that these Europeans are telling themselves this story every day. We're now talking about the great, they great, were, great though. grandchildren. They put it, they put it into children's books. They put it into children's books about their culture and how their country is great and what they do is great. Of like the original colonizers. The individual people didn't have the grand plan in mind to go carve up Africa. They were just responding to what they knew, what they'd been told was real, what they wanted to believe. It was a way of life it was a way of thinking. And if we think that we're somehow exempt from a similar type of mental model that we don't see, but that dictates our behavior, we're tricking ourselves. I mean, listen to one of these mm. British imperialists, Cecil Rhodes, who uh, says- This is the guy, this is the, this guy, Cecil Rhodes, is the face of European imperialism. We happen to be the best people in the world with the highest ideals of decency and justice, liberty and peace. And the more of the world we inhabit, the better it is for humanity. <laughs> okay. Cecil has made up his mind. <laughs> and again, but what they use as the evidence is a whole bunch of things that they are not actually responsible for and has nothing to do with some kind of inherent trait. Okay, so let's look at the map in like the early 1900s. Africa looks like this, completely carved up by European powers. Over here, the Dutch had conquered the entire Indonesian archipelago. The French completely taking over this part of Southeast Asia. But the real kingpin in all of this taking over land stuff was the British Empire. In addition to all this stuff they had in Africa, they occupied the huge Indian subcontinent. So I've never set on the British Empire. Like Hong Kong and Singapore. I mean, I can't go well, over. Hong Kong result of opium wars for all of the stuff they took over because it's just too much yeah. at the peak of their empire they ruled over 412 million people which was a ton for that time their domination like quarter of the world's population 25 percent of the globe making britain this rainy set of islands in europe the biggest empire that ever existed in doing right. so they spread their people their ideas their economic system their fringe language to every corner of the world including where i'm sitting right now because remember the u.s is just one expression of the british empire the branch of the empire that 
that went on to become the most powerful country in the world to influence how the world order would look. By 1914, Europe had successfully taken over the world. Yeah. They were deathly rich yeah. compared to the rest of the globe. And their ideas, both good and bad, were deeply embedded in the international system. But suddenly, all of this technology, all this industrialization that made them so effective, turned away from conquering faraway lands. This is where the, the cooperation idea isn't as big to me. It's, it's cooperation, it's a means to an end, right? All this was... The world is a, it's, it's a pizza, big pizza. And once you carve out the slices, if you want another piece, there you can't create more pizzas. There's only one pizza. The earth is the one pizza. You're going to have to go after somebody else if you want that other piece of pizza. All of this was leading to this. Um, yes, World War I honestly could have started in the 1880s, maybe if not for the Berlin Conference. Um, but nevertheless, this was leading to this. You know, cooperation was not a thing. And was turned on each other. For the next 30 years, hundreds of millions of people are killed in the two most destructive wars ever, made possible by all the same things that allowed Europeans to take over the world. Sophisticated right. weapons and technology. Start using against and people. Europeans Start using against people that actually have it, unlike the imperial conquests of the um, time period. They're now turning on each other. The so-called sophisticated race is now slaughtering one another <laughs> on an unprecedented scale. These wars didn't do the image of the civil. So is this where the cultural superiority argument is is torn apart? Is this where it falls to shreds as a result of these world wars? Um, can they have that argument anymore? These nations, the same ones that preach that, but now are you know engaging in this. Europeans any good? And Western schooled local elites decided that they didn't want to be ruled by foreign forces anymore. They were able to rally their people around a common language and birthed national identity that didn't include being ruled by white people from some faraway continent. Some and places they pushed did, the yeah. colonists out, sometimes peacefully, but most often with force. The Europeans had built this insane global project for more than 400 years, and yet they saw it crumble in a matter of decades. And hold on to these empires even if they wanted to so, after the wars. Today, the map has been severely redrawn. Former colonies are now mostly independent countries. There are still a ton of weird idiosyncratic holdovers from the colonial period. I've talked about those many times and I will continue to talk about them. I want to finish this up, finish this video and finish this series up with my last thought here which is something that the map doesn't tell us much about. Okay. Roll them up. Even though all these countries became independent and they can claim their own sovereignty, their own borders, their colonizers are gone, they didn't actually. Not only were there loads of borders that were literally drawn by colonizers, you right, can see right. basically all of my previous work. But by the end of this, it was the Europeans that had tied the whole world up into an interconnected system that still kind of echoed the old one. The Dutch invention of the shareholder corporation didn't go away. Private companies didn't suddenly stop looking to the same far off places to find- There who. did end up being more competition though amongst companies when there was not. These were monopolies at the beginning. That's why they were able to imperialize it. They did not have competition. It was not very capitalistic. There was no competition resources, to find days. labor, to feed increasing demand among their people back home. And European rulers and their offspring didn't stop using their big metal guns and their technology to get what they wanted in faraway lands. Occasionally talking to each other and occasionally fighting with each other. Fighting to control land. But when they did, it was catastrophic. People, to control ideas. And perhaps most powerfully, the idea that our enlightened way was indeed the best way. We will stand with the new leaders of Iraq as they establish a government of, by, and for the Iraqi people. <laughs> that's, what, that's what happens in a lot of these places when you see specifically what is going to happen in the Cold War. Once, the, once these nations get their independence, they were not allowed to just walk away and do whatever they want. United States and Soviet Union very much were right on the shoulders of every independent nation across the newly independent nation um, across the world saying, hey, uh, you're independent now, but here are some rules you're going to need to follow. OK, and they're all going to follow, you know, in some way benefit and become allies economically, militarily of um, these places, these uh, of the United States or the Soviet Union, these countries um, are not going to be able to control their own destinies in a lot of places. Plus, you got to understand when this decolonization happens, these places were left with nothing. It's not like Europeans dropped off 
some money and resources to build up your new country. They took everything and left and did not build up infrastructure um, or institutions and stuff like that, because that was never the point of colonialism. It was not to build institutions and infrastructure for the colonies, even if they wanted, even if the nation colonizing nation was saying that, right? It did not happen. So that was never the purpose. It certainly has not gone away. Middle East, yet, Africa, we're, we're Asia, simple, all those places. A simple Civil wars. narrative of good and bad. Greedy Europeans take over the world and do anything to stay ahead. That would be a lot easier in some ways, but it's not. Europe taking over the world has also thrust humanity into an age of peace and prosperity, where people live longer, suffer less in a lot of ways, have more food to eat. I mean, the very moral lens that you and I are using right now to evaluate say it's a net positive the good for and bad everyone? of this history, that was a lens that was cultivated and developed by the same cultures that pillaged and subjugated their way around the planet but those those things those peacekeeping things were not put in place until okay until those powerful nations could harm each other and did harm each other they did not exist before that that's when they started taking peacekeeping and negotiations more seriously until they were themselves affected by it not before it these ideas these were reactionary objective. systems not preventative systems Justice and equality and human rights and representation, social equality and self-determination, those ideas permeated the globe alongside the colonizers who carved it up. And yet Oof. it was this conquest that- What are you guys thinking right now? What are you guys thinking? Y'all cringing or are we good with this? What do you think? Let me know down below. People on top of the whole system, giving us the power and the advantage, the default power holders in our world. I always ask that question. I always like to ask that question. I ask it to my students, ask somebody. Who is us? Who is we? Who is our? These three parts have been a story of how an isolated group of farming people, some of them my ancestors, left their shores to explore, discovering a vast world that eventually they would find a way to control. And in the process, setting the rules for how things work today. What's slightly scary to me about this is how easy it is to look back on this whole history and feel like it was gonna happen this way no matter what, that it was inevitable, that of course Europeans took over the world. They were always more adept, they were bound yeah. to control the planet. But if there's anything Too I've many uncontrolled factors. into this broad tour through European imperialism is that this idea is just hindsight bias. This didn't happen because of some superior DNA or because God wanted these people to take over right. the world. Sure. But rather it happened But he still hasn't discussed the <laughs> but he still isn't everything he said has been of human choice people happened to be not the uncontrollable right factors that allowed them to start geographic luck. millions of little decisions that pushed them to do whatever they could to procure more and more resources they got ahead because of lucky circumstances and yet today in our modern world we continue to do whatever we need to to stay ahead while simultaneously believing that it was always going to happen this way and he's out. All right. Okay, final thoughts. All right, if you have stayed with me till the end here, thank you very much for doing that. Now, I'm not going to go through right now and go through everything that I agreed or disagreed with him. In fact, I couldn't even keep track of it because he did do both. There were plenty of historically accurate things he did. There were plenty of things that actually were very important that were left out of this. And I don't go straight to the, like some people do, straight to the accusation of that it was, um, they, you know, omitted things on purpose. There's just sometimes a lot of things to cover. And we've all been exposed to different ideas about history. And uh, not to say that my things are always the better, the better that I've been exposed to. I always hope so. I have a YouTube channel where I can learn and heard different perspectives. Um, but we all learn in different ways from different things and our histories are all tied up with this. So anyway, I think I was able to point out, I think a bunch of things that I think um, uh, Johnny does admit, but again, he's a fantastic YouTuber and also made a lot of very good and accurate points. And that's kind of what you get with anybody that's trying to educate on things. Again, that have to do with history. History is not a perfect thing. It is not math. It is not science. Um, it is always open to interpretations based off of the evidence and we need to keep looking at those things. So hopefully you enjoyed my commentary here. Again, this was all unscripted. I had not seen this before, able to take away a few things. Um, I'd love to get some opinions from you all about this. So put down in the comments, um, what are the things that Johnny got right? What are some of the things that he got wrong in this scenario? 
All right, with that, um, thank you for being here um, and checking this out. The original video link is down below. Again, make sure you're supporting Johnny, getting the view and, and uh, that kind of thing. If you like what he was doing here, you know, subscribe to his channel and like his video. And if you like what I'm doing here, let me know what I need to be doing more of. Hit the uh, thumbs up if you like this and sub, and I'll know that this is the kind of stuff you want to see me cover more. All right, with that, we'll see you next time. Bye.